My name is Jamie Lemke. I'm a senior fellow in the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. I'm here with my colleague, Dick Wagner, the author of a book we're going to be discussing today, James M. Buchanan and Liberal Political Economy, A Rational Reconstruction. Thank you for joining me here today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So this is a dramatic oversimplification of the structure you just built, but you have all of these superstructures, constitutional politics, self-governance, uh, post-constitutional politics, the moral and social philosophies that come out of this analysis, and at the root of all of them is this idea that public finance should be uh, a way of understanding relations between free democratic peoples rather than simply being a science that exclusively speaks to relationships between rulers and their subjects, or a despotic kind of public choice. At the time that Buchanan is doing this early work, how revolutionary is the idea that these public activities can be founded on a democratic basis rather than um, more of a despotic basis within the, the science of public finance? Well, there were certainly precursors to the work that Buchanan did. Uh, in his doctoral dissertation, Buchanan cited two uh, precursors to there. One was Knut Wicksell, a Swede, who throughout his Buchanan's career, Buchanan regarded as the single most important person for his constitutional work, uh, who thought of the same kind of question of how could you have a a parliamentary system suitable for Sweden, uh, where in the underlying Swedish parliamentary activities would reasonably strongly reflect a consensus among the, the Swedish population. And how could you go about, you know, Wixel asked questions, how could you go about imagining a, a mode of doing Swedish political business that would fit that image? And then the other source that Buchanan uh, mentioned was an Italian fellow, Antonio de Vitti de Marco, uh, who Buchanan later spent a year in Italy uh, studying a variety of Italian authors. Uh, de Vitti had only has had one book published in English, and Buchanan had read that it was published and translated in 1936. And it too offered two different ways of ideal types of democratic forms, what he called a, a cooperative democracy and what he called a monopolistic form. And the difference between the two forms fit with Buchanan's image of self-governing republics versus uh, republics dominated by special interest groups. And those were, those corresponded to Davidi's two forms. And so, uh, in many ways, what became known as public choice in the very late 1960s, early 1960s, was already in play in Italy in the 19, actually going back to 1888 and into the 1900s, because you had a variety of Italian public finance theorists who likewise uh, sought to develop a explanation of how governments actually do their business as against someone saying how a government, they think a government should do its business. Like the, the, the long tradition of public finance was, you might say, concerned with the practice of statecraft. What would be a good tax system Adam Smith, you know, in his Wealth of Nations, had these four maxims for a good tax system. At the time that Buchanan was a student, the two main figures in public finance were Brits, Francis Edgeworth and Alfred Pigou. Now, Edgeworth formulated a good tax system as one that would minimize the, the uh, utility losses the taxes imposed on people, however you would ever determine that. There was an Italian named Emil Cari Pugliani who wrote a theory of public finance about maybe 1903 maybe, 
And mm -hmm. his concern wasn't in trying to say, to advance his thoughts in what would be a lovely tax system, but was rather in saying, well, the world has a rhyme and a reason to it. Uh, and Puviani said about saying, well, there's a rhyme and a reason to all that happens under the sun. Economizing actions are useful principles for understanding that. And he set about trying to explain the kind of what he thought would be the logic by which uh, tax systems were established, were revised over time. And, you know, Puviani has never been translated into English, but has been translated into German. It was translated in 1960. And the sponsor of that translation was a man named Gunter Schmulders. Uh, he, has, he was doing work in what was known as fiscal psychology at the time and is kind of a forerunner of behavioral economics today. And Schmulder probably chose to translate Pubiana and not Davidi because Davidi had already been translated into German in 1934. And so he, he presented Pubiana, but he also in a, wrote a foreword where he said uh, Italian public finance has long had a political science character to it, where you have an integration of economics and politics, and with these ideas often giving a very good uh, fit with reality. Suppose you took a bunch of these Italians. See, the public choice got named at a meeting in 1968. It had a couple of prior meetings in Charlottesville when I was a student there. Uh, and it got established in 1968. I, I posed the hypothetical question. Suppose, like, you know, the story of Rip Van Winkle, I guess, and he, he fell asleep for 20 years and woke up. And suppose you took these Italian dudes, like Davidi and um, Pantaleone and so forth, and they had fallen asleep. And then they woke up, and here they were, in, or in Chicago in 1968. And they were jumping into the discussions that were going on about what was then called non-market decision-making. I think those characters would have been right at home. The Italians and the Americans would be speaking the same language. Sure, they'd have somewhat different emphases and so forth, but they're all speaking the same language. And I think what, in my estimation, what Buchanan foremost did was really serve to connect what was a short-lived, Italian orientation towards collective activity uh, and brought it uh, forward under the, under the rubric now of public choice. It's always a pleasure talking to you, Dick, and today was no exception, so thank you so much. Well, thank you so very much. I always love talking to you, too.